Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Thursday, July 23rd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your namesake. Amen. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live, and let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe, and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross, therefore I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. Our Old Testament reading tonight is from the book of Acts, chapter 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he, he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Stop right there briefly. A lot of people have questions about that. They said, Okay, I thought we got baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and that being baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus means the same thing. They would say, okay, be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, and they would baptize in the name of the Trinity. Uh, so there's some confusion on that because it is confusing. It sounds like, okay, so you have John's baptism, baptism into the name of Jesus, and then baptism in the name of the Trinity, uh, which Jesus said. And so when they say baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, they are referring to what Jesus said when he gave the Great Commission. You know, go ye therefore make disciples of all nations. Uh, so there is uh, no need to have uh, confusion about that. Now you know. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, uh, the way is what they called uh, followers of Christ. He withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even his handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I abjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. 
Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to fifty thousand pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Archaea, and to go to Jerusalem, saying, I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Our Book of Concord reading today is from the Augsburg Confession, and we will read Article 7 on the Church, Article 8, what the Church is, Article 9, Baptism, Article 10, the Lord's Supper, Article 11, Confession, Article 12, Repentance, and Article 13, uh, the use of the sacraments. And that is only about two and a half pages. There's not much to that. Uh, and now the articles will begin to get longer. Article 7, The Church. Our churches teach that the one holy church is to remain forever. The church is the congregation of the saints, Psalm 149.1, in which the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. For the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human tradition, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same everywhere. As Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Ephesians 4, 5-6. And that is talking about, for example, our divine service settings. You know, that is also a matter of adiaphora, uh, things neither commanded nor forbidden, so every church does not have to do every liturgy exactly the same from church to church, or even in the same church from week to week. Article 8. What the Church is. Strictly speaking, the Church is the congregation of saints and true believers. However, because many hypocrites and evil persons are mingled within them in this life, Matthew 13:24 24-30, it is lawful to use sacraments administered by evil men, according to the saying of Christ. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, Matthew 23, 2. Both the sacraments and word are effective because of Christ's institution and command, even if they are administered by evil men. Our churches condemn the Donatists and others like them, who deny that it is lawful to use the ministry of evil men in the church, and who think that the ministry of evil men is not useful and is ineffective. Of course, what that is saying is that uh, even if your pastor does not believe in God, he's faking it, but he gets up there and he says the words of institution over the bread and wine, you don't have to worry. You are receiving the Lord's Supper because it depends on the word connected to the elements uh, according to Christ's institution, not the person doing it because he's not a ma magician and he is not uh, making an incantation. Uh, he is just the person doing it. Uh, the hands of God, as it were. Article 9, Baptism. Concerning baptism, our churches teach that baptism is necessary for salvation, Mark 16, 16, and that God's grace is offered through baptism, Titus 3, 4-7. They teach that children are to be baptized, Acts 2, 38-39. Being offered to God through baptism, they are received into God's grace. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists, who reject the baptism of children, and say that children are saved without baptism. Article 10, the Lord's Supper. Our churches teach that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and distributed to those who eat the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 10.16. They reject those who teach otherwise. Article 11, Confession. Our churches teach that private absolution should be retained in the churches, although listing all sins is not necessary for confession, for according to the psalm, it is impossible. Who can discern his errors? Psalm 19.12. And that is something that is actually uh, still offered to this day. You can have private confession and absolution. Uh, your pastor cannot uh, repeat any sins that you uh, mention to him because, in fact, he is not hearing them. God is hearing them, and he is only the ears to God. So as soon as they go in your pastor's head, they go away. He doesn't even remember them after you've had that conversation. That is the seal of the confessional. Uh, so, for example, if you confess that you killed someone, he can't tell anybody. 
although uh, one thing to be aware of, not that anybody's going to do this, but uh, the question does come up. If you say you're planning to kill someone, he is actually duty-bound by the state to inform the authorities. But other than that, he cannot repeat anything that happens in confession. All you have to do if you want private confession and absolution is make an appointment, and uh, your pastor will do that for you. Article 12, Repentance. Our churches teach that there is forgiveness of sins for those who have fallen after baptism whenever they are converted. The church ought to impart absolution to those who return to repentance, Jeremiah 3.12. Now, strictly speaking, repentance consists of two parts. One is contrition, that is, terrors striking the conscience through the knowledge of sin. The other part is faith, which is born of the gospel, Romans 10.17, or the absolution and believes that for Christ's sake sins are forgiven. It comforts the conscience and delivers it from terror. Then good works are bound to follow, which are the fruit of repentance. Galatians 5, 22-23 Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who deny that those who have once been justified can lose the Holy Spirit. They also condemn those who argue that some may reach such a state of perfection in this life that they cannot sin. The Novatians are also condemned, who would not absolve those who had fallen after baptism, though they returned to repentance. Our churches also reject those who do not teach that forgiveness of sins comes through faith, but command us to merit grace through satisfaction of our own. They also reject those who teach that it is necessary to perform works of satisfaction commanded by church law in order to remit eternal punishment or the punishment of purgatory. Article 13. The Use of Sacraments Our churches teach that the sacraments were ordained not only to be marks of profession among men, but even more, to be signs and testimonies of God's will toward us. They were instituted to awaken and confirm faith in those who use them. Therefore, we must use the sacraments in such a way that faith, which believes the promises offered and set forth through the sacraments, is increased. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 Therefore, they condemn those who teach that the sacraments justify simply by the act of doing them. They condemn those who do not teach that faith, which believes that sins are forgiven, is required in the use of the sacraments. And tomorrow evening we will continue with order in the church, church ceremonies, civil government, Christ's return for judgment, free will, the cause of sin, and that is where we will end because the next article is good works, which is quite a bit longer because the reformers had to explain uh, their very, very different uh, teaching on good works from that of Rome. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But, ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled, and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people, for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine, which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. 
Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, since you never fail to help and govern those whom you nurture in your steadfast fear and love, work in us a perpetual fear and love of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.